Happy Sabbath and welcome to the 12th lesson of the third quarter of the Teens Cornerstone Connection Lesson of 2023. This week we have Barack on the mission story. In the orchestra we have Amy and Ariana on the violins, Sid on the piano, and Sakai on the trumpet. For the lesson panel we have some of the Nairobi Central teens along with their teen teachers. Enjoy! Praying for Mosquito. It was a very, very dark night. Mother, father, and little four-year-old Maris were sleeping in their house in the countryside of Latvia. It was so completely dark that you couldn't see through the window and you couldn't see your hand if you put it in front of your face. Suddenly, mother woke up, which was unusual because mother usually slept very soundly. When she put her head on the pillow, she fell asleep in two minutes. She only woke up when the sun came in the morning. However, this time it was different. She woke up with a jolt, very awake, that is. Father was sound asleep beside her, and somewhere in the dark room was four-year-old Maris, still on his small bed. God, why do you wake me up, she asked. What do you want from me? What do you want me to do? Mother wondered if someone was in danger somewhere in the world, and God wanted her to pray for that person. So she began to pray. She prayed for hospitals, she prayed for sick people, she prayed for prisons, she prayed for people dying, she prayed for everybody driving on the roads and for children and the whole world, but still she couldn't sleep. Then that's when she heard the sound. It was the sound of a mosquito and she knew that it was flying around her head. Mother jumped up and ran out of bed to the place the sound that was coming from, but unfortunately she couldn't switch on the light because it would wake up father, who usually slept very poorly. She tried to catch the mosquito by following its sound. She grabbed it frantically, but missed over and over again. After trying and trying, she thought, she thought that the best thing she could do at that moment was to pray. So she prayed and asked God to help her catch the mosquito. And by faith, she stretched out and she caught it. She was so grateful to God, and she ran to her kid's room and found him and he was awake. She asked if he was awake and he was awake. He asked, she asked if it was a mosquito that had woken him up and he confirmed it. And that's when she knew how prayer works. First, the mosquito woke up Maris, her kid. Then Maris prayed to God for help. Then after that, God woke up the mother. When the mother didn't know what to do, she asked God, what do you want me to do? Without having an answer, she started praying for the whole world. And she asked God for a second time what he wanted her to do he pointed her to the mosquito. So mother got out of bed and caught the mosquito. When she prayed for help, God gave her the strength to catch the mosquito. Um, as I was reading this, something that really stood out to me is that no matter how ridiculous your prayers may sound, none of it is, is trivial before God. God cares about each and every one of our problems. There's a quote that says, whatever makes the soul uneasy, even if it's a mosquito, from mosquitoes to financial problems, or it could be school or grades, all of it is relevant before God. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help children know about the power of prayer in Latvia. The offering will help construct a building in Riga, the capital, where kids can learn about the God who hears prayers. We will now say a short prayer for the 13th Sabbath offering that it may accomplish its intended purpose. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Dear God, we'd like to pray that as people give offering towards the 13th Sabbath, that you may please help it build a place in the capital city of Latvia where children can learn more about you and grow spiritually. This is my prayer, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good night from wherever you're watching us here in Nairobi Central SDA Church. We'd just like to thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, boy, do we have a wonderful lesson for you today. Uh, the title of our lesson today is Famines and Feasts. Famines and Feasts. And before we start, I'd just like to ask uh, our panelists over here to introduce themselves, after which we shall say a prayer. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Henry Obara. My name is Ashley Silas. <coughs> and I'm Sid. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. My name is Bismarck Lumumba. Uh, could we say a prayer before we begin? Let Let's us pray. pray. Our kind and loving Father, thank you for this day, for your love and your care, your grace that is ever sufficient, your hand that leads us through and through. Even as we read your word, we ask from understanding, we ask that your spirit may illumine our minds and give us something that will encourage us in this journey. For this is a humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Karibu Sana, thank you very much. Uh, wherever you are, please pay attention because we're going to be getting our lesson. This lesson, our lesson this week is an interesting lesson. It's a lesson all about money. It's all about money. What you do with your money, what you think about money, what God thinks that you should be doing with your money. What relationship should you have with your money? And, you know, it's a wonderful lesson. And we're going to dive right in uh, with reading the first part of our lesson, just our key text, our key text. Even before we get into it, perhaps uh, I could ask uh, uh, Henry if you could just read for us our key text, which comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verse 22 to 23. Yeah. All right, and uh, it reads... Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. Aha. Uh -huh. And so the key text, ladies and gentlemen, is actually a speech from Moses, right? And here, Moses is telling the Israelites to remember. To remember, you know, and be sure to set aside a tenth of all that they have. Huh? Of all that they have. And he has a wonderful list over there, you know, that's so far reaching. He says, of your grain, of your new wine and olive oil, you know, the firstborn of your herds and your flocks. Yeah? He has such an elaborate list. And he tells them, set a tenth of that. Put a tenth of it aside and pay it, you know, expensive endeavor, I would say. I don't know what do you think. I don't know what do you think. What do you think, Ashley? Um, in the what do you think section, we are going to assume, just assume, that we had a bottomless bank account, endless money, and limited cash. So the question is, what would we buy? Sid, what would you buy if you had unlimited money? I mean, I'm sure what the first thing that would come to anyone's mind is to buy everything. Like, you have a bottomless bank account. You have, you're loaded. Like, you want this, you get it. I mean, the, the first thing that would come to anyone's mind is buy everything. But for me, um, I think I'd buy everything that I need. And then, you know, the rest maybe keep for later. Maybe something will come up and, uh, and then I'll need cash, yeah. Henry, what would you buy if you had endless money, unlimited? If I had unlimited money, I'd probably buy myself a bike first, you know, like <laughs> a, a, a nice sports bike, and then, uh, yeah, maybe a house, and then, you know, keep the rest for later. Yeah. Interesting. Shabis Mark, what would you buy? I'm curious. Uh, right now, right now, I'd buy a Land Rover Discovery. If I had uh, a bottle of my bank account, that would be my first purchase this afternoon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You'd walk into a car dealer's shop and buy a Land Rover. Yes. Interesting. I am torn. I don't know. Perhaps I'd fly out of the country. I don't even know what I'd do. Perhaps now, because I have endless money, I'd stop going to school. I don't know. It's All the knowledge would be now useless. I really don't know. Um, read the following statements. Which are the ones we agree with and which we disagree? Is it seen to have more money than you need when others are starving? Sid, is it seen to have more money than you need when others are starving? It's, it's not a sin. I mean, most people would think, like, this guy is greedy. 
but it's it's not really a sin to have more money than you need when others are starving because i mean you worked for that money so if you have more money than what you need means that you you worked very hard for that money so i i don't really think it's a it's a sin to have more money than you need when others are starving plus you could also help them with that other with that more money that you have and if you had no more money than you need then you would not be able to help them interesting um henry is it do you agree with the statement that says people have a right to do whatever they want with their money uh i believe uh i agree with this statement uh if you worked for your money you've earned it the right way and uh yeah god has blessed you with it then you have the right to spend it however you want yeah you have the choice to spend it however you want however it doesn't mean that everything you spend your money on would be the right thing to spend it on you could end up spending it on the wrong things yeah and uh yeah now you could say uh you've misused your money yeah um shabismak is money the root of all evil money certainly contributes to evil you know I, i you know we were just talking earlier about this and we were saying that you can't really do anything without money even good charity work you think about charity work you can't do charity work without money right but uh, and then you ask is money the root of all evil money certainly contributes uh, to a lot of the evil things that go on in our in god's good world but i wouldn't say it is the root of all evil i think the root of all evil is really the human heart uh, you know in the bible we are told that the heart is deceitful above all else who else can know it you know um, there's also a verse that says the love of money is the root of all evil so money is not necessarily Indeed. yeah the root of all evil but the love of, the love it. of money yeah um i would agree with the statement that says that everything we have belongs to god because he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills and the rubies and the diamonds and the coffers of gold in the entire universe are his and created by him like think about god as like countries have currency right but god created the richest currency and that's gold and there's no currency that can match it you can choose a billion dollars to buy gold gold is just gold yeah uh before you move on ashley i just wanted to uh, pick up on something that you asked henry uh you know you asked him do we have the right do you have the right to do as you please with your own money right Uh, but I, I noted that what do you think section, there's a question there that asks, you know, do you think that the money is a gift from God? And if it is a gift from God, then do you have, do you the really rights. have the right? You know, are you free to do with it whatever you want? Or are there some constraints? Are there some expectations from God on how you use your money? Okay, my question is, Sid, if I were to give you a 10,000 voucher, it's a gift, right? Yeah. Do you have the right to do with it anything you want or that or I'd dictate? No, you you give it to me. I do whatever I want with it. So God gave us everything we have. Do we have the right to do with it everything we want or anything? Yeah, think about it in terms of uh, other resources. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, your time or even your body. God gave you your body. Do you have the right now to use it or abuse it as you please? You have the right question is we is it is it is it is it prudent is it are prudent? there expectations exactly for you to do it in another way yeah so mm-hmm. even as much as we have like the legal drugs in Kenya yeah. right yeah we have the right to use legal drugs uh-huh. but, but is you? it pr- is it prudent should we use cocaine or caffeine or nicotine because it's prudent or tobacco because it's legal Well, you know, that's a question for everybody to ask. But I think what we want to impress upon you, dear viewer, is that, you know, implicitly, implicitly, there is, we have a responsibility to use our money prudently. It is just a resource like any other that God has been able to give us. And just the way, you know, you don't want to abuse your body because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Similarly, you don't want to use your money, you know, in a vain way. Uh, perhaps uh, needless spending that perhaps will not bring any glory to God. You see? So there is almost a give and take there that you really have to be careful about. Mm. 
Um, all right. Well, thank you, Ashley. I think I've really enjoyed the, the what do you think section and having these discussions with you. They're very important, uh, by the way, and very complex, mind you. Uh, but we wanted to move into the story, into the story. Tell us what the whole story is behind the tithe and the offering, uh, as we have seen. Uh, Sid, uh, take us away. So today's story comes from Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 to 33, and Haggai chapter 1, verse 2 to 11. Uh, a tithe of everything from the land, whether, whether grain, from the soil or fruit, from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the, uh, to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every title of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. Anyone that makes a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is, it is, is it a time for you, for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to, uh, to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and and uh, be honored," says the Lord. You expected much, but uh, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, of the, uh, because of you, the heavens have withheld the dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the, and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and all, and on all the labors of your hands. Yeah, thanks, Sid. Uh, I think you read that wonderfully. Uh, now, um, this story is very striking. I don't know if you, if you have just looked at it, eh, or if you heard what Sid read, eh, but God here is really condemning people who did not pay that tithe. I don't know if you've seen it. Eh? And he actually gives a very stern condemnation, you know, in that last paragraph where he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. You know, and he says, give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring down the timber and build my house. You know, uh, later on he says, uh, uh, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. You know, what you brought home. And so there is a direct correlation here, ladies and gentlemen. God is actually saying there is a direct correlation within, between you surrendering your money, giving your tithe and your offering, to the reciprocating blessing that you receive. Huh? It's interesting yeah. that he says you planted much mm -hmm. and then the what came out of it, like for instance, you planted maize, you took it to the pusher mill and you expected 10 kilos and you had seven. Mm -hmm. Where did the maize go? And God says, I blew upon it. Mm -hmm. And he says it's because they had left their ho God's house in ruin. So I wonder whether... Does the service of God or the service that we do to God, the things that we do in this life, do they have a correlation with our satisfaction and the blessings that God gives us? Like, 
Um, there are so many people who have everything in the world, but they have emptiness mm -hmm. in themselves. And all the money they have and everything they own is not enough to fill this gap. And there are some who are not, they do not have everything. They are in between here and they are surviving and they are fulfilled. So the question is, can money fill the gap that God has placed in our hearts to draw us to him, the gap that only he can fill and service to others. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, Henry, what do you think about it um, as, we, as we try and move on? Uh, I think the question here is really, you know, um, does money bring the satisfaction that, that, that we all crave? Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I think that uh, the satisfaction that comes from money is an equivalent to maybe the satisfaction of helping other people, you know? Like, for example, um, you see uh, a child on the street, and instead of you uh, going maybe with your like, 500 shillings mm -hmm. to go and buy, I don't know, let's say a donut or a slice of cake, mm -hmm. you decide to go and buy bread and milk for this kid. Mm -hmm. The smile on their face mm -hmm. is far more satisfactory Very than true. you going to have bought that cake or keeping it for whatever reason. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Do you, do you think it's the same for you? Yeah, no, I do think. You see, um, what, what's actually being told in the story is that the way we spend our money essentially shows what we value sure. and shows where our heart is implicitly, right? And so, you know, as opposed to, you know, I said earlier that I'd buy a Range Rover. Now you already know what I want, you know, you already know where my heart is. Now, you know, you have to think about when they had neglected the temple of the Lord, you know, was their heart with God any longer? You know, it wasn't there at all, right? And uh, and just and and just from there, you know, I'd just like us to read uh, from the Monday part, just very quickly, um, and just go through some of the punchlines and some of the the scripture. Uh, uh, Ashley, perhaps if you take us through that very quickly. Um, I will start you know. with um, Psalms fifty verse nine as my choice, and you can, all of you can choose whichever of us, it says, I have no need of a bull from your stall of goods or from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. So I think this just goes to say that he owns everything. And even when we ask of him, he, he has not given us every single thing we need, though our needs are catered for. And something interesting is that God cares about our wants. Something that it's just about your personality, like you personally. It's going to cost a little more, but me personally, I can't wear such a cloth. It's, it's God that created you with that um, taste. So he cares about the things that we find insignificant. If you look at the mission story we had earlier, someone prayed that they could catch a mosquito. If you ask me, that was really ridiculous a prayer. Like, how do you ask God that they, you could catch a mosquito? I mean, you could just... Spray doom or something and forget yeah. about it. So yeah, yeah. Thanks, you know um, that's actually a very good verse, and I like your illustration on it. Um, what I think that it's saying, you know, God already has enough money. You know, he's saying uh, I don't need the, I don't need your contribution, and so he's saying I'm not really looking at your money. You know, I'm not looking at your subscription fee. What I'm more interested in is your heart. Yeah, is your heart. Um, look at, uh, uh, for example. Uh, uh, verse, uh, if you go to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 17, verse 25. Uh, Henry, if you could just read it for us, there's the punchline, yeah. All right, and he reads, And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and, and everything, everything else. else. Mm -hmm. And it's just reiterating the same point, that, you know, God is not interested in our money. You know, he's not actually looking for you to give him money. You know, there are other places that are interested in that. The government of Kenya are interested in your money, you know. But for God, that's not his key. He already has all the money that he needs. Uh, see if you could just read for us Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 48. Okay, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Aha. Uh -huh. And so really what you're looking for here, and what God is really asking you to do, eh, is to give from a place of, 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 
of not necessity, but from a place of voluntarily. You know, he wants you. He's actually looking at what is what is your attitude. You know, and I can tell you for sure, ladies and gentlemen, and you can take it to the through the bank. There's no better way to know what somebody is thinking than how they spend their money, than how they use their money, how they regard their money. You know, it is a telescope into the heart. It is a telescope into the heart. And so God is using this uh, to really know if we are committed to him uh, as, as he deserves. All right. Uh, we want to move swiftly to the Tuesday part. And this is the flashlight. Uh, uh, Henry, why don't you shed some light? You know, uh, shine your torch. <laughs> All right. Uh, light uh, your candle. Flashlight. Light your candle. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so our flashlight, it reads, God has made men stewards. The property which he has placed in their hands is the means that he has provided for the spread of the gospel. To those who prove themselves faithful stewards, he will commit greater trust, saith the Lord. Them that honor me, I will honor. This is from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verse 30. So in this flashlight, uh, God calls men his stewards. That means everything that we have or we own actually belongs to God and he has just given us temporarily to take care of it for him. He further uh, spreads insight and he says that um, the property which he has given to man it should be used to spread the gospel. So um, my insight from that would be if you have something and you're not putting it towards a good purpose in terms of um, helping spread the gospel and showing God's love, are you really being a good steward? Because, again, he says, faithful stewards, he will commit greater trust. Greater trust may not necessarily mean uh, more wealth, more money. It could also mean uh, more support from the community. It could also mean that he gives you greater influence to reach out to more people. Because the purpose of us uh, Christians uh, in the church is to spread the gospel for the Lord so that the word can reach all parts of the world so that everyone has an opportunity to be saved. Yeah, that's so important. That's so important, you know. God has made us his stewards. I don't know if you guys understand just how uh, uh, magnificent that is, you know. God has really entrusted us, us, mere mortal men. You know, he could have done it by himself, you know. But he has chosen us. He has chosen us to do it. And I just want to impress on us the fact uh, that coming from out of the story, uh, and the conversations that we have just had, you know, there is a, what, what I like about the Bible is that there is, a, there is a law and there is a causation, you see. You can see that because God has made us stewards, right, and he has entrusted the work of sharing the gospel, which is really the work of reclaiming this good earth, you know, from sin, you know, he has now set up a law that we ought to tithe, you know, we ought to give a free will offering, you know because of the work of salvation. And that's really uh, something of, of immense importance. Huh? Uh, Henry, why don't you tell us again about uh, uh, Patriots and Prophets, uh, uh, reflecting on page 259. I don't know if you can just read it from the, from the third day part there. There's a, there's a little quote, and then perhaps just expound on it. All right, uh, so um, Patriots and Prophets, uh, and he reads, the plan of Moses to raise means for the building of the tabernacle, tabernacle was highly successful. No urging was necessary. Nor did he employ any of the devices to which churches in our day so often resort. He made no grand feast. He did not invite the people to scenes of gaiety, dancing, and general amusement. Neither did he institute loiteries, nor anything of this profane order to obtain means to erect the tabernacle for God. The Lord directed Moses to invite the children of Israel to bring their offerings. He was to accept gifts from everyone that gave willingly from his heart. And the offerings came in so great abundance that Moses bade the people to cease bringing, for they had supplied more than could be used. I don't, I, what I'd like to say about this is how uh, it said, no urging was necessary, nor did he employ any devices to which churches in our day often resort. I'm not sure if you've ever gone to a construction site, for example, something like a church, and seen how much machinery is used these days. 
Back in the day, they didn't have such technology, but built more magnificent churches than those that we have today. What I'd have to say about this is, God, when God asks you to give, it's not because he cannot get the resources he needs himself. He can. As you can see, he said, no urging was necessary. That means he didn't need to advertise that, you know, we needed um, money to build a church. Mm -hmm. He just wanted people to give freely and willingly from his heart. And so he compelled many people to actually give towards this cause, and the church was erected. Yeah. What do you um, think um, of this? When, when Henry mentioned that uh, they didn't have, back in the days, they didn't have this kind of technology, and they still built more magnificent churches, it makes me wonder, are men becoming smarter or dumber? Dumber. Because That's... back in the days, if you, if you ever go, if you ever find time, just go and Google, search up one of these ancient buildings. You'd see they have, they have murals on the ceilings. They, they, have, they have marble all over. And they didn't have this kind of technology. If you see pillars from back then and compare them to the pillars that we have now, it's it's very different. True, true. In terms of in terms of getting smarter, um, we we are inclined to believe, or we tend to believe that as days go by, technology gets better, the AI is coming up, and we are getting smarter. But the truth is, we are getting dumb, and that's why we need so many machines to do all these things. Because back in that day, did people have calculators? My father told me that he did not use a calculator in his KCSE. But us, we use it in our biology, chemistry, everything. We use calculators. And even in terms of height, over the ages, men are getting shorter and shorter. Sin is degenerating. So there's no way we can be getting smarter. All right. Well, that's a whole other debate. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, coming back to this, uh, I'm just impressed, you know, by... Uh, by, by, by these people, you know. Um, and I think what the lesson is trying to emphasize is that, you know, they, they, they didn't have to have a harambe, essentially. You know, they didn't have to changa. They didn't have to do anything, you know. These were gifts that were given. And you should have seen that tabernacle. It was wonderful, you know. Um, he, Moses didn't even have to ask. You know, these days you have to do a whole campaign. You know, you have to, you have to hire a PR team. You know, but Moses, he, had, he didn't even ask that. He said that he did not even invite the people to scenes of gaiety, dancing, and general amusement. You know, neither did he institute lotteries or any of the or anything of that profane order. You know, they were free will offerings. Free will offerings. Uh, it reminds me of a story, by the way, in uh, one of my favorite books. Uh, that is the book of First Chronicles, and that's when David is just about to die, and he's now gathering uh, material to build the temple. You know, and they give so much. They give so much. Um, in fact, they give overwhelmingly. You know, and at the end of it, at the end of it, you know, you'd be thinking David say David would be saying, yeah, "Look, God, look at all the stuff I've brought." You know, oh, we are we are great. We are something else. But then you know, David he says something opposite. He said, "Who are we? And what is my house that I should give so much to the Lord?" You know, and it's just. Again, emphasizing that attitude that you ought to have when you're giving, you know. You ought to be thinking, you know, none of this is mine anyway. And that, mm. and that, and that, um, from that text is where we get the song that was played earlier. We give thee but thine own, whatever thy lot may be, mm -hmm. for all we have is but thine own, I trust a lot from thee. So we, we, we take what is God and give back to God. Mm -hmm. Like, we take what is God's. He has given it to us. Mm -hmm. So... The illustration I used, I give you 10,000, a voucher of 10,000. You split it in half and give me back 5,000. It kind of doesn't make sense, you know? But um, the Tuesday part was a bit interesting. It says that interview someone who has faithfully paid tithes and offerings for many years. Ask the giver if they felt that it was a worthwhile investment. See if the person has ever had any regrets about giving. And is there a better way to experience the faithfulness of God than through giving? And how does it benefit the giver? You know, someone I know, someone I know, yeah. said that, you know, he was not paying tithe, and then he started paying tithe. And I was feeling like, you know, my money wouldn't be enough if I pay tithe, but he decided to pay it anyway. 
and he got into an accident. Not a bad accident, but he just bumped into someone's car. And the person was like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, you just go, it was an accident. And he didn't get a cent out of his pocket. And he's thinking, well, I just began paying my tithe. So it's not about us spending money on God, but we benefit more by spending that money in useful things like the church and charity and the things that we've been called to do more than we would benefit if we put the money in our pockets. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you've just raised. Uh, thank you so much. It's so insightful, by the way. You know, I know at times, uh, you know, you pay your tithe and then you think, uh, <laughs> you know, this money I could have used it somewhere else. You know, I could have utilized it. I have needs. You know, and sometimes it's actually quite a sum of money. Mm -hmm. mm, I don't know what you guys think. Uh, just before I say my point, uh, what do you guys think? Do you think that you know you should be actively looking at at it as a, as an investment? Do you think giving of tithe is an investment that you make? Do you should you expect a return, or should you just give and forget? Of course, in Malachi three. I think every every Adventist who knows this text, Malachi 3, 8 to 10, says that, try me. Will a man drop God? No, try me. Try me in this and I'll open up the windows and your storehouse will not be able to contain the blessing that I give you. So I think giving to God is, okay, not an investment, but he will give you what you need in the right time. If you're faithful, he'll also be faithful. Like um, Henry said, that Psalms, what's, um, Second Samuel, I think, 2.30, God, those who honor God, God will honor them. So I think if you give to him and you're faithful and you are in need of something, he has no reason to deny you. He has no reason to deny you. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your comments as well. What do you guys think about that? Uh, should you expect a return, ideally? No, uh, personally, I feel uh, when you're giving tithe, it's not something that uh, you should expect to receive back because tithe is used to support God's work and also to help you know, the needy in society. So when you're giving to such people, you shouldn't say, oh, I want back my, let's say your tithe is 10,000 shillings. I want my 10,000 shillings back, you know. That, that, that's enough to fill up my car for the month, you know. You, when you give, you should give and forget and be grateful that it's going to make someone's life better. Because at the end of the day, if you look what uh, many people say they would have spent that 10% on, it's not on needs, it's always on wants. So for example, they would have said, oh, I could have gone to a restaurant, I could have eaten at, an, at a nice restaurant, you know, and paid maybe half that money. Uh, I could have, uh, I don't know, taken a train all the way to Mombasa, you know, and then I would have saved some money. That's a want, but honestly, those people have needs. So if you're depriving yourself of a want to give someone else a need, I mean, yeah. which is very important because you never know when your time of need will come and mm -hmm. then you really understand why tithe is important. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Um, what about you? What do you think? Mm. Um, uh, I think, you know, you're giving tithe because God has blessed you with money. So you give tithe back to God's house because like, you know, what if God didn't give you that, that job that pays you well? Would you still be uh, asking for the money that you give, that you uh, that you put as tithe? Yeah. You would not have anything to give, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. So so like, giving tithe is you saying thank you to God for giving you that job. Mm -hmm. True. 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 More yeah. so. More so. Yeah. Um, all right then. Um, I think we're going to conclude, but I just want to say that even if even if you should not expect a return, there is a blessing. Yeah. And the book of Malachi that you've just quoted, you know, and we know that, you know, shaken down, uh, pressed, pressed together down. together and running uh, over. Uh, running over, overflowing. Uh, so there's a blessing that is expected uh, if you are faithful. All right. Now, we just want to conclude and go to the Friday part. Uh, an important part of money, you know, as God would have it, would be giving back to the poor. Mm -hmm. Right? And giving back to the poor is something that, uh, you know, has been... Uh, has been in the limelight for as long as we can remember. We remember Jesus and Judas, you know, when the lady came and washed Jesus' feet with the uh, expensive perfume. Uh, and Judas said, uh, you know, this, this could have been sold and given to the poor. You know, and so we just want to understand what should be our relationship with giving and especially the poor. Uh, Henry, perhaps if you could take us through that. 
Yeah. All right. So uh, we're mostly going to focus on um, Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 51, which is titled God's Care for the Poor. In summary, what I understand from uh, this chapter is each and every single human being is a representation of God, whether rich, whether poor, whether ugly, whether pretty. They are all part of God. So when you refuse to give to the poor, you refuse to give to God. And in the Bible, um, I believe it's in Matthew when he reads, uh, uh, I, I was sick and he did not care for me. Care for me yeah. I, I was hungry and he did, did not, not feed, feed me. me. Mm. I was in prison he and did he did not, not come visit, to me. visit me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So um, what I understand from this is that since everyone is a representation of God, the man asked, but Lord, Lord, I never saw, saw you. you. Mm. I never saw you. But God comes in different forms. You won't see God as uh, the images you see, for example, in church. You won't see him as the guy with the beard and the really long hair. God comes, could even come in the form of you, yourself, you know. Maybe you might be in need. Maybe you may want to speak to someone, but then people don't want to speak to you. And yeah. that way you're depriving uh, yourself from helping God. Sure. So in summary, the relationship between God, the poor, the sick, um, the needy, the lonely, is that God manifests in everyone. God lives in everyone. And uh, if you do not uh, take care of people around you, especially when you're a little bit better off than other people who are around you, then you're depriving yourself of an opportunity to enter heaven, you know? Because literally, you're just denying God. You're saying, no, I don't want to visit that person. Mm -hmm. They're in prison. I don't want to associate myself with bad people. I don't want to feed that homeless guy. He's homeless. He's dirty. I don't want to be seen with him. Mm -hmm. But the part of being selfless, like Jesus was to come all the way to earth, is what we should try and emulate as human beings. Um, and I would like to say that you see the the part, the giving of the poor, visiting the sick, those who are in prison, and and the vulnerable of society distinguishes who goes to heaven and who does not. That's how serious this thing is. So. I think we do have expectations on how we're supposed to spend our money and spend the time and the treasures that and the opportunities that God has given us. And you notice that in judgment, we'll not, not have the omission, commission, but we'll have the sins of commission and the sins of omission where you failed to do, not because it was not in your ability or you did not have an opportunity, but you overlooked the opportunity. So I hope that... Um, Every one of us would take this into In consideration. consideration. Yeah. No, true, true. Um, yeah, this this is a, this is a very interesting lesson, ladies and gentlemen. Mostly because it affects our daily life. It's so practical. It's so practical, right? Uh, but unfortunately, we are running out of time, and so I just want to give our panelists a one more moment <laughs> to uh, just give a closing remark. Just a closing remark. Um, what has really touched you in this lesson? What do you think? Uh, go ahead. Uh, we'll start from Sid and we go to our left. Um, what caught my attention in this lesson is the fact that, you know, God, God, God gives good takes. Mm-hmm. So if he gives you and then you're not grateful for what he gave you, he'll take it back. Okay. Like how God was, um, like in the story... God was, uh, uh, God was. I don't know. I don't know. Should I say cursing yeah. the people that were, the they they had they had left God's house. They they they're polishing their houses. Yeah. They have wooden floors, marble ceilings. But the house of God is basically like a a, a pigsty. Yeah, yeah. No, true. Um, just as you're saying that, I was reminded of the saying: "Take things for granted." Take things for granted, and they shall certainly be taken from you, right? And we know what happened to the Israelites, even after they neglected uh, uh, God's uh, house, you know. It was now taken, know, from, taken from them, and it became a heap of rubble. Ashley, what do you have to say? My parting shot would be that God intends that those who have worldly possessions shall regard themselves merely as stewards of his goods, as entrusted with means to be employed for the benefit of the suffering and the needy. It may not be money. It may be the intelligence you have. You may be good with people. You may be able to talk to people and they, 
they they get a sense of comfort they get a sense of encouragement we have all been given different gifts as much as money is a major role and it plays a major role in day to day lives i'd encourage every one of us everyone who hears this voice you look at what is this thing that god has given you and you do not use it to help others out of necessity but you use it because god has given it to you and most of the time you'll find that that thing will give you a lot of satisfaction yeah true i just like the way you've put it you know stewardship is not just about money our lesson today is so far reaching it's not just about the money you have it's about every single thing every single thing your time your resources you know your skills your abilities everything how are you going to use them you know mm. and what god is really keen is on is your attitude do you think about them as your own do you think about them as something that you can use to uh, you know to 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 advantage yourself you know are they selfish means that he has just given you or are they indeed something that you can use not only to benefit you but to benefit everyone in society henry my takeaway uh, is god doesn't force god doesn't force mm. uh, i feel like the story of uh, the is the Israelites giving uh, to the construction of the tabernacle is really important and shows that God may give you everything that uh, you have but he will not force you to give back he will not force you to contribute to um, certain causes it has to come from the heart and uh, certainly as everyone has said that uh, <laughs> if you if you do not um, give it shall be taken away from you yeah and i don't know that yeah. that that just really hit home you know yeah, yeah paying yeah. tithe is super important guys yeah. just make sure you pay your tithe because yeah. it's not like it's going to a bad cause it's always going to a good cause yeah definitely definitely um totally this lesson ladies and gentlemen is so interesting and it's so far reaching and we could emphasize any one of those points we could talk about money we could talk about giving to the poor we could talk about stewardship we could talk about it the whole day we could talk about it the whole day but ladies and gentlemen what i just want to emphasize as we close is that god is not really interested in your ability right if we remember the parable of uh, of uh, the servants and the and the master who went out for a long journey you know each of them had they were given each of them different you know different abilities different talents right but the only when he came back the one who got the 5 and the one who got the 2 and had multiplied it they all got the same commendation well done good and faithful servant right mm-hmm. what god is really keen on is your attitude how do you view money huh how do you view your skill sets how do you view your resources are they just you know for your own personal gain hmm? are they just for yourself huh? what he's interested in is knowing and seeing that these resources that in your heart of hearts you do not value them indeed in fact i'm reminded of the first commandment um, thou shalt have no other god before me a lot of the times people tend to put money as a god right but what tithe what stewardship tries to teach us is that we should not have these things at the forefront at the forefront of our lives indeed they are just tools and so ladies and gentlemen i just want to thank you so much for uh, being with us here and uh, paying attention until the end and until next time we wish you a wonderful week uh, join us next time thank you very much let us pray dear father in heaven oh lord god thank you so much for the resources that you've blessed us with father please help us to be faithful in jesus name i pray amen, amen.